Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Today, the subjects of our video are right before you. These two old, from the early 90s, JVC Super VHS VCRs. I thought what we'd do today for a video is talk about what some of the common problems are with these units and how you can address those problems. Just in case you happen to need one of these old units yet. I've chosen the, the early 90s ones for a couple of reasons. One, I bought my first VCR in 1992. It was a JVC HRS 4700U, much like this one on top here. It worked properly for two months and then failed. It wouldn't record hi-fi properly anymore. And it took me eight years to figure out and fix what that problem was. And I'm just making this video so you don't have to spend another eight years doing what I did. So yeah, anyway, that's the plan. Both of these machines came from eBay in 2020. I got so bored sitting at home with all this COVID stuff going around that I thought I'd start doing electronic projects. So I bought these two units off eBay in uh, for parts as is condition. And I decided maybe I can fix them. So I took the gamble, I bought them and I got them to the house here. And as it turns out, I was able to fix both of them to 100% functionality. So. We're going to talk about what these two machines needed and uh, yeah and i think what we're going to do is we're just going to use the bottom unit what we have here is an hrs 4700u up top and an hrs 6800u on the bottom both of these were introduced at the same time roughly from jvc and Back at the time these were introduced, there were numerous models. I'm not sure if there was a model immediately above the 6800 down here. There may have been, because JVC was crazy about that, but at the very top you had the HRS 10,000U, and I've never even seen one of those, so who knows whether or not my tips for today will be relevant for that machine, but they are relevant for both of these machines because they're both built on the same platform, if you will. So let's just get into this right away. We'll take this one off the top so we can get at the, the 6800 a little better. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, this thing was a high miles machine when I got it, or high hours, I should say. And I'll tell you how I know that after I get the cover off here. Basically, the way I know that is you see that little head cleaner thing there? Right here? See how it's discolored? That thing's cleaned a lot of head material, or a lot of tape garbage off the heads. And this is the head drum right here. But that was not the only problem with this machine. This machine had a lot of problems. Let me see if I can move it around here so we can get access to the mechanism a little better. Now, when I got this out of the box and turned it on for the first time and tried to play a tape, it turned on properly. There's this little flip down door in the front here, you can see. Anyway, it turned on properly and I tried to put a tape in and it, it accepted the tape fine. So th this loading mechanism was working properly. But then when I went to play a tape, it would unravel the tape and wrap it around the heads like it's supposed to but then it would immediately shut down and I and I kind of from previous experience I kind of knew what was going on because anytime a JVC deck like this shuts down after trying to play a tape there's a problem with a the transport 
So what I did was I took this cover off, like you see here, put the tape back in, tried to play it, and I immediately saw that the take-up reel down in here was not turning. And the cause of that turned out to be, if I can show you, turned out to be those gears right there. Those are the idler gears. They're supposed to be able to flop back and forth like you see here to engage the different reels. It goes this way for rewind and this way for play and fast forward. Well, this was frozen in place. And the reason for that happened to be just really old grease. So I cleaned off the old grease. I got out some three in one oil because I didn't have my luber plate stock yet and I just oiled it up temporarily, stuck a tape in, and voila, it started playing the tape. Except there was a new problem. The new problem was it would play the tape, only there was a big band of noise in the picture, and that is one of the most pro common problems with these old JVC VCRs. And we're gonna get into that in detail a little bit later because we have to get up from underneath. We have to get the bottom panel off for me to tell you what that problem is all about. But yeah, it had a big band of noise in the picture, so I thought, oh, okay, I can fix that. Very common problem. Very easy to fix. So, I then went to rewind that tape, and the VCR immediately shut down again. Only this time, it didn't just shut down. The whole display in the front went completely black like there was no power getting through. So, most common problem number one, that right there, whoops, went too far. That is the power supply of the unit. And this is a switching power supply and I don't know how else to tell you this, guys, but every capacitor JVC used in this is garbage. From the factory, they used 85 degree parts and they just did not hold up over time. And this was no exception. This is the same power supply that is used in the 4700U. And I've known about this since the mid 90s because my 4700U had the same problem with the power supply. I packed it up and took it home one day for vacation to my parents' house. I got it out of the box, I hooked it up, and I was ready for a nice evening of movie watching, and nope, VCR was dead. And the reason was the power supply capacitors. I had to go in and recap them, and this being the, the early to mid-90s, I did not have access to DigiKey like I do now. There was no internet and stuff to go buy parts with. I had to go to a local electronics place in Saskatoon and buy whatever they had, which happened to be general purpose. I went with 105 degree, so at least I didn't screw that up. But the new capacitors got the VCR just sort of working and it just stayed in that sort of working condition until I was able to get the good stuff to put in it. Which happened to be about the same time I recapped this one. So yeah, I ordered enough capacitors for this machine, the eBay 4700U and my 4700U, and I just did all three in one big job. And that finally brought my 4700U back up to full working order, sort of. My 4700U was high miles too, so. A lot of problems with that unit by the time I got it recapped properly. Okay, so that's your first common problem. Be ready to recap these things. There's a lot of them in there and you've got to do every single electrolytic. Every single one of them. This one's got the good stuff in it now, but uh, by the time I got to it, there were leaking capacitors everywhere, so I had to really work hard to clean up this power supply and use it. Otherwise, I could have just swapped in one from the other two machines, because they are the same power supply between them. 
Now, I've got to do a caveat though. The European models are quite a bit different, so don't expect their power supplies to inter interchange with these because the European models all use a different television format, so those are completely different models entirely. So, can't just swap between the U European and US market ones. It's got to be US market only, or US and Canada, or whatnot, or NTSC only, if you will. Okay, what other common problems can we talk about here, other than the idler gears and power supplies? Well, it's not going to let me move down any further, so I'll just pick you up here. The next common problem to talk about are these guide arms. I'm just realizing I forgot to tell you what the first problem was with this unit when I got it out of the box. The first problem was it had a part loose rattling around inside of it. And that part happened to be this guide post right here. It had fallen out and was lying somewhere back in there, I think. So before I even powered it up, I had to get that guide post out and epoxy it back in place down in there. So I did that and yeah, that's when I found out about the the whole shutdown issue and the, and the problem with these gears down there. And we're gonna relube these gears in this video because I never did replace the three-in-one oil, so we're gonna save that for last. Anyhow, next common problem has to do with these guide posts and their little pins underneath that hold them in place. They, see, they've got these little plastic pins that hold them into the tracks underneath, and those can work loose. And what happens if they work loose far enough is those pins fall out, these come off the track, and then whammo, they go right into your spinning head drum, which destroys the video heads. So you don't want that to happen, not even once. So make sure all these pins are fully seated, and they're fully tight, maybe give a little very light pull up on the on these assemblies themselves and make sure they're fully locked into place because if those pins are even slightly loose, these will not hold the tape in the in the path properly. And you'll get bands of video noise in the sit in the picture. And it won't track properly and it won't work properly. So yeah. Just something to look for. Now, what else can I talk about while we've got it up here like this? I'm thinking we gotta move to the underside now. Oh, there's one helpful service tip I can give you while we've still got it up on this level. This circuit board here, there is a way to hold it in position so you can work on it on it or the board beneath without having to mess with anything. You take out all the screws and there's some in back here where the jacks are. So you gotta sort of be careful. And once you get this board loose, it folds out like this. And there are two notches, or at least one notch, back in here that you can use to hold this circuit board in the fully upright position so you can work on it. I discovered that first time I got into this thing, for or the first time I got into the, my 4700U to work on it, so you'll probably figure it out pretty quick, but yeah, it's just a little bit easier to work on if you can do that, and as you can see, you have to do that in order to get the power supply out, because these two screws hold in the power supply, and there's a tab for the power supply underneath this board. So yeah, you gotta do that. Anyhow, I guess I'll flip her over now and we're gonna get into some of the other common problems. So let me just move you over here. I'll go full wide on you. And we're just gonna flip her over like so. And I'm just gonna go ahead and take out all the screws. Okay. 
and you do have to take the top cover off in order to get this lower panel off so do that first if you're working on one of these and be very careful when you put these screws back in because it's real easy to strip out the plastic underneath I'll show you how I do it later there's a little bit of a trick to it getting these kinds of screws back in when they're going into plastic on electronics I believe I've mentioned that trick before on one of my boombox videos, but I couldn't tell you which one, so we're just going to mention it again. And might as well do that now. I'll grab one of the screws now. Don't just spin them in the regular way. What you do is you turn backwards. And you'll hear and see a little bit of a, a thump as it drops down into place. Now you can screw it in because we know we found the threads. You have to do this because otherwise it strips out the screw. We'll just do it again here. There, did you hear that little thunk? That was the screw finding the right thread. So yeah, that's how that works. Anyhow, we are about to talk about the most common problem with these old JVC units. And there's more than one problem to address here, so I hope I can set you up here to see exactly what's going on. We're going to zoom in on the video drum. There we go. You see that capacitor there? You see how that's probably not the original capacitor? You're right. This is the most common problem with old JVC units. It doesn't matter if it's super VHS or regular VHS. If it's from the early 90s, that capacitor will have to be changed, period. The stock part is a surface mount electrolytic and it goes bad literally all the time. I don't know exactly what part JVC used in that, but it's a bad quality part and it does not last. My machine had to have it done within a year or two, my 4700U. So yeah, remember I was talking about that big band of noise in the video picture once, uh, once I finally got the transport working properly in this unit? That's that capacitor at work. Basically what happens is if this capacitor is bad or if it goes high ESR, what happens is the machine can't track properly. The auto tracking doesn't work and you can't manual track either. You have to replace that capacitor in order to get the machine working again. And you can either do it the way I have it here, fold it over this way, or you can fold it back over in this area, which is probably the better way to go. Because if you do it over here, you have to make sure that these guide pins don't interfere with it when they come through the track here and hit that. You don't want the guide pins to hit that. So fortunately in this machine, that's not a problem, nor is it a problem in the eBay 4700U I showed you. But yeah. I can't quite remember offhand what value that capacitor is. I want to say 3.3 microfarads at 50 volts, something like that. I'll put a notation on underneath the, the video if I can verify that for sure. And if that's, if it's a different value. So yeah, I was watching this abandoned house video once exploration video of a house that still had the power on and it had the and it had an old JVC VCR and a bunch of home videos and the guy exploring the house wanted to watch one of those old videos and wouldn't you know it VCR fired up started playing the tape and guess what noise in the picture I knew instantly what that problem was and I knew instantly how to fix it and I knew instantly that I could fix it in maybe 30 minutes 60 at the most. 
But yeah, in order to replace that capacitor, you can do one of two things. You can either cut away this plastic up here and just solder right down from there, or you can do what I did and remove the entire transport. And if you're gonna remove the entire transport, be very careful around the video heads. What I like to do is I like to put the transport face down like this on a towel. That way the video head drum is basically no chance of getting damaged. Anyhow, yeah, that's the most common problem, that capacitor right there on the drum board. And like I said, it is a surface mount capacitor, so you need a fine tipped soldering iron, but it's not especially hard to do. Okay, next problem. And something that affected my 4700U. That there gear. You see how it's made of cheap plastic? Well, they crack. Or they can crack. And there used to be a source for parts on these, an aftermarket source for, for that gear. On my machine it was cracked all the way across one edge here and it just couldn't make any friction anymore on there so it would the machine would play but fast forward and rewind no worky so I had to go looking for a new gear and I was able to find a source for those aftermarket gears the guy only had three of them and keep in mind that this is three for the entire planet. I was only able to find those three. So I bought two of them. And I used one to fix my old 4700U and the other one's still in storage for, for what happens if this one cracks because I want to keep the 6800 working now. The 6800 is the model I couldn't afford back when I bought my first VCR but really wanted, so. I am very much wanting to keep the 6800 working, so yeah. Before you do anything else, check this gear, make sure it's not cracked, and make sure you can find a replacement if it is cracked, otherwise no point doing any further work. Because uh, the new gear has to be epoxied in, and yeah, it's, it's a pain, but you can do it. I did it. And another thing to check down here is this belt. These don't go bad very often, I find. This is the original one that came with the unit, and I believe these belts are still available, so we're not gonna worry about them too much. Now, another common problem. We'll go this way. Is the mode switch, which is found right down in there. It's that little red plastic thingy here. And if you're very careful, you are able to pull up this board enough to disengage it from the mechanism so you can get back in there with a dental pick and run it back and forth for cleaning. You probably will have to do that because if this mode switch is dirty and you go to pause a recording and then do the retake feature, which involves hitting the re rewind button or the reverse button while it's paused, Normally the VCR is supposed to be able to show you on screen the video as it, as it winds backwards. But if this mode switch is dirty, it will eat the tape instead. So ask me how I know about that. So if you're getting into one of these, clean that switch. There's a little screw that has to come out there and there are these little plastic tabs you gotta disengage. You're probably not seeing this other one very well, but these plastic tabs, you have to disengage those and pull it up just far enough to get this little U-shaped thingy-madoodle to clear the mechanism, and then you can run it back and forth a bunch of times to clean it. That's basically all I do with those. Now, I was talking about those guide pins. And I'll show you them from the other side here, if I can. That's one of them right there. 
you have to make sure these are fully seated into their guides from below here. On my 4700U, I just epoxied these in because with that, with that machine being such a high miles unit, I figured at this point, it just doesn't hurt to, to go ahead and epoxy them. Why is this thing moving so slow? Anyways, so yeah, as it turns out, my old 4700U had an additional problem with that, uh, with that capacitor down in there. See, the technician I brought it to, to fix the hi-fi dropout problem that never got fixed, he figured that capacitor was the cause of it. It wasn't, but he changed it anyway, and in the process of changing it, he pulled the trace right off the board. Either his iron wasn't hot enough, or he wasn't paying attention, I'll never know, but he got in there with a small strand of wire and sort of got it working again. I wasn't happy with that, so I had to do it all over again, which involved taking the stator off this thing, adding spacers, and then completely redoing that little jumper wire he soldered in. Not fun, I'll tell ya. Anyhow, I'm happy to report that my work was a lot better. That capacitor is in there and it's not going anywhere. If I can show it to you again from another angle. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see from this angle. Let me get a flashlight on it. All right, you can see my little replacement capacitor there and you can see which traces are used there. Let me see if I've got something a little less huge than my fingers here. I don't know if you can really see too well, but there's a very tiny trace right about where my screwdriver is pointing right now. And if you pull that trace up, good luck fixing that. That's what I had to fix with my 4700U and what the tech messed up. Anyhow, the hi-fi dropout problem in my 4700U happened to be just the just the deck being out of alignment on the hi-fi end of it. It was not recording to the proper signal strength. So what I had to do to fix that was I had to get in here, I had to flip this board up, and then down on the lower board there's an adjustment for hi-fi power level. And what I had to do was, I had to go by trial and error, just tweaking on that control, recording content, and then playing it back to see if the hi-fi dropped out anymore. And finally I got it! After eight years of trying to fix that stupid machine, I got it. The right way to to twiddle on that control is to get into the service manual and use an oscilloscope on the test point they lay out for you, but I had no access to a service manual and I had no oscilloscope, so I just basically did what I could. So, yeah. Right now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to relube those idlers. And I need a videotape to do this. Fortunately, I have one right here. It's an old one, kind of dusty, but it'll do. Now, in order to get at this idler gear, it's actually not as hard as you might think. You do not have to remove this mechanism to do it, thankfully. What you do have to do, and you don't have to do this on the 4700U because it doesn't have this fancy loading door in front, but on this machine you do. What you do is you partly insert a tape so it unlocks the, the loading mechanism. Now you take your tape back out gently, like that. And now very gently, you come in here well, let me see if I can get you a better angle first. You come in here and you manually manipulate this mechanism. You can see the gears are spinning down there. Don't go hard with this because you will damage something. And we can just move this little tray out of the way. 
And now we've got all the access we need to those gears down in there. So let us remove those gears. And I'll try to work around the phone here. We have two screws, one on each side. If I can see them, I got to stand up to do this. Helps to have a magnetized screwdriver on this kind of a job. All right, both screws are out. Now we just get down in here and we should be able to just pull those gears straight up and out. Might have to manipulate them a little bit. It's been a while, so. There we go, out they come. We'll set that down there and move this up here. And now we can work on the gears. Maybe. I'll zoom in a little bit here. Now what we have to do is we have to take this whole assembly apart. And the way you do that is this, there's this little E-clip here. Don't lose that clip. These things are a bear to deal with, but... I will just be right back. I need a little bit of a screwdriver to do this. All right, here we go. I should have been better prepared for this, but I wasn't. Literally recording this on the day it's due to be uploaded. So, let me see if I can get you on camera here. There we go, we got the E-clip off. You don't have to use a lot of force with them, but just a little bit. And be very careful because this is spring-loaded and there is this little washer underneath. That little black washer you have to put back on. So we're going to put that down there. And there are four little tabs on this little plastic piece that have to engage with this black gear beneath. So remember that. And there's a spring here. Don't lose that. And now we should be able to just pull this gear off. And this is where I had to do my lubrication. Because this is where all the, the nasty old stuff was. And be aware, this little felt piece here, that's a clutch. Do not get any lube on that. That would be bad. But yeah, all of this was just gummed up with old grease and and it just did not flop back and forth the way it was supposed to, so fortunately the three in one oil worked, at least temporarily. So yeah, we'll just take this assembly up like so. And this is where we're gonna put our luber plate. If I can get it out. And it doesn't take much. That ought to do it. I'm just going to spread it around a bit with my fingers. And we're going to do just a dab on the shaft as well, because that does need to be lubricated. Like so. If you can see that. And then we'll just... Well, actually, I don't know. I don't believe these gears themselves need to be lubricated. I don't believe I could do it even if I wanted to. But they're spinning freely, so we're not going to worry about them. Now we're going to just put this back 
on like so. Moving nice and freely. Now we've got a relube around here as well, this black gear. So I'm going to grab my paper towel here. Just clean her up as best I can. Which doesn't amount to much, but whatever. Still a little bit of the old grease, but I'm just going to go ahead and do this anyway. Sorry, I've got you off camera again. I'm just sort of going around adding a light coat of lubricant. And there's a little bit much here on this end, so we'll just do this. Get our lubricant plate just sort of meshed in there with the gears. And remember what I said, do not put lubrication on this white plastic piece, because that's the one that contacts the clutch. We can't have any lube there. So, should be okay now. I will put this back in place. It's moving nicely. Now we got to put this stuff back on. I don't know why I'm reaching around the tripod here, but I am. Oh, that's right. We forgot the spring. We got to put the spring on first. Spring is important. We like spring and fall and sometimes winter. I'm really not a winter guy. Anyhow, we need our washer again if we can get it off the table. I guess that's one way to do it. And now, come on, go into place there, you. Just be patient when it comes to stuff like this. Take your time, you'll get it. And I'll get it, eventually. There we go, now we can put our E-clip back on, and this is the fun part. This has always been the fun part. Especially with my big sausage fingers. There, we've got her seated. It's just a matter of pushing her in place. And it's best if you do this facing something that can catch the this little bugger if it goes flying, because they love to do that. Just go like that. You see what I mean? And I just lost it on the floor. Great! That always happens when I'm doing stuff like this, but I'll find her. I always do. Okay, so I got the E-clip back on. It's ready to go back in. Little tip about these E-clips, if they go flying off, don't panic. You will find it. Just stop what you're doing very carefully. Think about where it flew off to, and then just go look for it. Use a bright flashlight, and you'll usually find it. But yeah, we've got a nice lubricated idler set up here, so we are going to put this back in the deck now. Or at least we're going to try to. Can be a little tricky to do this part, so once again, be patient.
There's really not much you can screw up though if it doesn't go in properly on the first time. I'm just gonna see if I can get a better angle here for myself so I can see what I'm doing. Yeah, there is a little moving plate down there. As long as you don't disturb that, this will go back in properly. The moving plate contacts or holds one of these, so you want that to be in the right spot too. But as long as you don't move it when you pull this thing out, it'll go back in properly. Or it should, anyway. Takes a little bit of finagling to get this in there, but it'll go. Just like that. Now, if I can find my screws here, and if I can find the right screwdriver here, we'll just get those screws back in. You might have noticed I did that little run the screw back trick on this too, even though I didn't really need to. Just helps make sure you've got the threads ready to go. So that should be fully working now and all good. And I test it for you on camera now, except we had three power failures last week and during one of those power failures, one of my power strips burned up. The MOV that, that they use for, for surge protection, it just fried itself. So I'm down a power strip, so I don't have power to this thing right now. So in fact, I'm only using the one photography light to illuminate this whole endeavor. So yes, we got the idler back in and now we can gently move this tray back into place until it clicks. Right up here is the latch for it. On a 4700U, all you have to do is push that latch down and it will move it back. All right, or in, and you, blah. And then you will be able to move it back, I should say. But yeah, both this machine and the 4700U use the exact same transport, so the common problems with these are the same problems with the 4700. And as we're putting this back together, starting with the underside, I will tell you about what was wrong with the eBay 4700U. Honestly, the eBay 4700U was the deal of a lifetime. Just about. See, that turned out to be a low miles machine. A very low miles machine. The only problems it had were a dented up top plate. A dented up top plate. The faceplate was broken. You can sort of see me pointing at it back here. The faceplate was broken. The loading door was missing. And the loading mechanism was broken. Oh yeah, and it also had that tracking issue with that one capacitor. Because that is something they will all develop. So what I ended up doing was even though I love my original 4700U and I didn't really want to retire it, I decided the best course of action would be to use that machine as parts for the eBay 4700U because the, 40, the, the one I got off eBay, this thing's just in brilliant condition. It's almost in new condition, if you can believe that. So yeah, the right thing to do was to use that one for parts. So I use it for parts. But I did still recap all three machines. Because why not? 
I, I was buying the caps for two machines, might as well get the stuff for the third. Wrong hole. What's interesting is you can see that this was set up for another one of these big feet, but they didn't come like that from the factory, which is kind of weird. It's like that on both this machine and the 4700, so don't know why they did that exactly, but it doesn't matter. Every single one of these screw holes is stripped out on my original 4700U because I got into it so often, but what can I say? I was very young and I didn't know about the trick of turning the screw backwards. So, yeah, I would love to test this out and make sure it's working, but if I do that, I lose a photography light. Hmm. Let's just go ahead and do it anyway. Y'all can see in the dark, can't you? All right, we've got power. Now, where's my tape from earlier? We'll just do that. And it's loaded into the ready position already. Play. It's playing properly. Fast forward. This isn't the true fast forward, it's just the slow fast forward. That works. Rewind. Back to play. Fast forward, and yes, we have a working unit still. So I'm going to go ahead and rewind this and we'll just pop her out of there. Now if it's rewinding slow, don't worry about that. JVC VCRs do this, especially their expensive ones. They go slow as you get towards the start of the tape, and they do that on purpose so that you don't break the tape. It's one of the things I kind of like about them. I wish they wouldn't keep the tape threaded all the way back here, but that's the way it is. And there we go. All I gotta do from here is put the cover back on, put the four screws on that hold the cover, and we're done. So I hope this video has helped you in some way. If not, if so, I hope to see you again in the next video. Take care, everybody.